Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. G. Marshall. The Wild West, which has become one of America's most endurable legends, lasted for less than 50 years. From somewhere in the early 1820s through perhaps 1870, the picture of the cowboy, the saloon, the sheriff with his two guns, and the wild and lawless men with the rough exterior and the smooth draw was reasonably authentic. This is a story about that era. I know you're the ranch boss, Mr. Patterson, but I got my orders direct from Mr. Chalmers. What orders? I'm to take the buckboard in to pick up Miss Chalmers off the railroad and drive her home. You're not picking up Mercy. I am. Now get on away from that rig and go round up that mangy Indian pony you call a horse. And you do as you're told. That's just what I'm doing, following Mr. Chalmers' orders. Well, we'll see about that. Now, don't you pull out of here till I get back from the main house. Or I'll be right on your heels. And, Bowles, I'm warning you. I'll be carrying iron. Our mystery drama, The Blue Roan Stallion was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Tony Roberts. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Sinoff, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Long before the middle of the 19th century... The American Indian was doomed. The buffalo that once roamed his vast lands and on whom he depended not only for food but every other aspect of his life was being wiped out. Cattle now grazed where once the buffalo roamed and the land they grazed was no longer Indian land but the white man's. Cowboys and Indians were natural opponents from their roots. This is the story of one young man who was a part of both and of a phantom symbol that tied them both to the past. What is it, little buffalo? Something strange, Mother. Beautiful. A blue roan stallion. Silhouetted against the setting sun. He's not one of our horses. Oh, yes, he is. Who was... Not this Cheyenne tribe. If it wasn't getting to be night, I'd try to take out after him and catch him. You never would. Come here, little buck. No. No, I mean Dan. I'm not ashamed of my Indian name. So you saw the blue stallion? The... I saw a blue roan. I think it was a stallion. You saw the blue roan stallion. It came for me came for you. Let me talk. First of all, the legend. In this Cheyenne tribe, the greatest warrior and counselor of all was... <laughs> Straight arrow? Oh, no, not your father. Except to me. I meant lone gray buffalo. My father's father. The father of the man I lived with in this tribe until he died. It was... Gray Buffalo's horse, and when he died, the great winter of the beaver, his horse died, too. The legend has it that his stallion gave his life so that he might carry his child across the wide water to the happy hunting grounds. Your father saw him out there, by the edge of the aspen, the night 
before he took sick. And the chiefs sent for you. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get here in time to say goodbye. He would have liked that. I'm glad you are here with me at the last. I'm glad I'm here to make sure nobody turned his back on you. Oh, they wouldn't have. I'm accepted now after all these years as one of them. As you are, I hope, in the other world. Because nobody figures me with blue eyes and red hair for a half-breed. I find it hard to believe sometimes there can be any Cheyenne in me. Was he really my father? Yes, son. And even though I sent you away all those years ago to live outside the tribe, he still remembered you as his favorite son because you were born of our union. I want it better for you. Better? The Cheyenne are better men than their white brothers. No. They are a dying race. I wanted the future for you. That's why I sent you to your aunt in Abilene. You said in your letters you studied at school. I did, Mother. I did. I can read and write. Oh, go, go there by the head of the cot and l look in the par flesh. Your father left you one of his treasures there. His Spencer rifle. His most prized possession next to his horse. You may have walked into this camp, but you'll ride out of it and armed. Not without you. That's what I came back for. No. I shall ride another horse. Listen. He is calling me. Who? The blue roan stallion. And seated on his back. To lift me in the arms and sweep me away as he did over 20 years ago. Young and straight in light bronze. The muscles rippling under his skin. The face fierce and proud. And the back straight as the arrow that gave him his name. Yes, straight arrow. I am coming again to share your teepee and your blanket. My love, freely given, never taken, always given, and never dying. Only waiting to begin again across the great water. Mother. Live to make me proud of you. And that is more reward than I can ask for. You go quickly over the fire. Oh. Yes. There he is. Sitting with the blue stallion. Waiting for me. So closely. And you will see me. Joy. of the mountains, across the flatlands, heading southeast back towards Texas. I had a good horse between my legs and a rifle I could drop a prairie dog with at a hundred yards. It was summer and before me I could see a far mile. I'd have never have seen him if it hadn't have been for the vultures. A big, heavy man, well-dressed, lying on his back, fighting to keep his eyes open. A Colt 44 cocked and ready in his lap, but one of them came too near. You want to put up your gun? Uh, I'll give you some water. Uh, gun is gun is for the buzzards, not you. A drink. I take it kindly. Here, here. Oh, Lord, hold on, hold on. Come at it easy. You tie up your belly in knots. Oh, damn fool. I know better. 
Only, only when you hanker this hard for a drink, it... No, no, that's enough for now. How long you been here? Well, since yesterday afternoon. My horse shied at a rattler. It threw me. Oh, my leg's broken. Oh, my ranch isn't too far from here. And horse, we couldn't make it by nightfall. You're not in any shape to ride. Let's have a look at that leg. It, it's just below the... Me. Yeah. Shinbone. Tibia. Uh, hey, what are you? A duck? Hmm. Me, no. Mm. Just a son of a school teacher. Here. Oh, uh, what is it, huh? It's a piece of rawhide fringe off my jacket. Fold it up so you can bite on it. What for? I'm going to set that leg of yours and it's going to hurt. I'll have to use my rifle stock for a splint. Had to cut your pants leg oh. away anyway, so we might as well use it to tie that splint secure. Oh, you get that bone in place so I can walk again. I don't care. You stripped me naked as I was born. We don't have to go that far. You're not doing any walking. You ride. I'll walk. Oh. You ride Indian style? No saddle? Hmm. It was a long winter for cow hands. Mm. Well, you get me back to my ranch, son, and you don't have to worry about winters as long as you want to ride, fence, herd, or cattle drive for the Crown M. My name is Hale Chalmers. Now, well, pleased to meet you, Mr. Chalmers. Dan's what they call me. Dan Bowles will do. Oh, why, what would do better? Nothing. That's my name. Okay, Dan Bowles. Let's get tracking. We got a right for peace to go before we make it to home. It would have been far traveling as we were. Me on foot and Mr. Chalmers barely supporting himself on Baldy's back. If long before we ever got in sight of the ranch, we didn't run into all the hands led by the foreman, Mike Patterson. Sweeping the range as far north and south as I could see, looking for Mr. Hale. Behind them was a buckboard with Doc Nate Reynolds driving, and as soon as he checked out Mr. Chalmers' leg, we all took out for the ranch, reaching there before dark. Before he passed out, finally, Mr. Chalmers had told Black Mike, as I later found everyone called him, to sign me on. Put your horse in the corral. I'll take you up to the horse house, boys. Uh, thank you kindly. You travel kind of light. Engine pony. Yeah. You steal them? Nope. <laughs> Hell, I don't care. <laughs> they mean the engines. They got anything to take, I'd take it after all the grief they brought us Christian men. You don't like Indians, Mike. No, I don't. I can smell them out like a rattler can a prairie dog. And uh, on this land, I'm ranch boss. And my name is Mr. Patterson. <laughs> I'd made a friend and an enemy. A friend I could reckon for sure. The enemy was just seat of the pants hunch. I wasn't that bad in need of a job. I had to work under a ranch boss like him. And I might have considered real hard about signing on if it wasn't for a thing happened the next day. Come. Uh, Mr. Patterson said you wanted to see me, Mr. Chalmers. I sure do, son. C come on in. Shut the door. Have some coffee with me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I don't reckon I could stop for coffee. Mr. Patterson wants me out riding fence. He does, doesn't he? He signed you on like I told him? Well, sir, I, I ain't rightly signed on yet. I reckon he wanted me to prove ours, and I ain't made up my own mind the whole way. <laughs> well, forget Black Mike. He's he's mean, ugly cuss a lot of ways, but the best ranch boss a man could ask for. Go on, sit down. Pour yourself some coffee. How's the leg this morning? Well, yeah, it hurts. Means it's mending good, thanks to you. Uh, got your rifle stock right here. <laughs> Need some cleaning. No, I'd, uh, I'd rather tend to that myself. <laughs> yeah, I figured you would. Figured you would. Uh, uh, and I won't ask another favor of you. Well, sure, Mr. Chalmers. I guess. 
Uh, to c come right down to it. I, uh, I hope you'll consider signing on here. Because I need a man like you. I'll think on. All right, now, second, now, you know where Miller's Junction is from here? Unless it's moved in the last month or two, I do. <laughs> well, my daughter's doing there tomorrow morning on the Union Pacific Railroad. Now, I can't pick her up myself laid up like this. Now, would you take the buckboard in and pick her up for me? Now, you go to the bank and see Mr. Slade. Now, I'll give you a dispatch pouch. Now, he'll give you an envelope with money we need here for operating expenses and uh, see your room and board at the hotel. You're putting an awful lot of faith in me, Mr. Chalmers. I owe you my life. Why wouldn't I? Suppose I was to take the money and keep right on going. <laughs> you won't. You meet my daughter, and I guarantee you won't. And we'll uh, take it all from here. I didn't know right then that I was going to meet my whole future and that whether it ended in life or death was a toss of the coin and not very far away. Some curious instinct, perhaps bred from the half of him that came from Indian heritage, faintly struck an alarm bell deep within Dan. Shutting his eyes against the sun as he came out of the ranch house, he could almost glimpse far off the vision of the blue roan stallion and hear against his heart the drumming of its hooves. I shall return shortly with Act Two. do cast their shadows before them. The trouble, of course, is that only in hindsight is that warning shadow perceived or realized, usually too late to change the march of fate. As with Dan Bowles, whistling softly to himself while he hitches up the buckboard, enjoying the prospect of the trip to town as any lone cowboy would. Bowles! Bowles, what in Sam Hill do you think you're doing? Hitching up the buckboard to drive into Miller's Junction. I told you I wanted you out riding fence. Well, I got to go by the boss. I'm the boss around here. Yes, sir. Ranch boss. But I got my orders direct from Mr. Chalmers. What orders? Take the buckboard in to pick up Miss Chalmers tomorrow off the railroad and drive her home. You're not picking up mercy. I am. Don't you pull out of here till I get back from the main house. Or I'll be right on your heels. And I'll be carrying iron. <laughs> carry a gun. It's not a way for a man to prove he's a man. I know I can shoot. I had a rifle in my hand since I was five and my father first put it there. I can take the head off a prairie hand at a hundred paces. So by the time Mike came back, I had my old Spencer lying easy in my hands. But I could see he was in no mood to fight. I bold you. Finish hitching up the buckboard. Yep. I'm ordering you to forget the fences. You climb aboard and hit off for town like Mr. Chalmers told you. Yes, sir. But don't you get no big head. And you get Miss Mercy back here safe and sound, or you'll answer to me as well as to her father. I reckon I'll do my best. You better. <laughs> you may be walking tall now, Red. But don't think you won't end with me cutting you down to size. I took a notion the minute I laid eyes on you, there wasn't going to be room for both you and me on the same spread. When the train pulled in next day, it wasn't hard to spot Miss Chalmers. Only two people got off, and one was a man who helped her down. She was a small person, dressed Eastern style in a long, silky dress, with a great wide hat of straw and a dark, chestnutty hair. And dark brown eyes so big and deep a man could drown in them. <laughs> and I did. I was in love with her from that very first moment. Miss Chalmers? Y yes? My name is Dan Bowles, from the Crown M. Your father sent me here to meet you and see you back to the ranch. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Bowles? Uh, uh, Dan will serve, ma'am. I'm, I'm just a hired hand. Oh, well, you must be something more if Daddy sent you to pick me up. And even if you weren't, we'll stick to Mr. Bowles. He, he's all right. Daddy's all right, isn't he? Just laid up for a short spell. Why? 
Uh, seems like his horse stepped in a gopher hole and throwed him. He wasn't hurt bad. Uh, broke his leg is all. Only a shin break. You got some luggage I ought to be picking up. Uh, yes, I do. Well, then I'll get you settled in the wagon and go fetch it. I reckon I'll just trail your dust for a while. You are headed for quite a roundup. You sure have a lot of belongings with you, Miss Chalmers, for a visit. Who said it was just a visit? Well, ain't you still schooling back east? Ain't you still schooling? Oh, come on, Mr. Bowles. You can do better than that. When in Rome, you know what they say. Indeed, I do. Do as the Romans do. But do you know who said it? I believe it was uh, St. Ambrose in reply to St. Augustine. <laughs> Which ain't going to interest nobody too much west of the Missouri. <laughs> Should we take on out, ma'am? By all means, Professor. You seem to have the class well in hand. <laughs> you can josh me all you want, Miss Chalmers, but when it comes to class, then I guess you could always show me my place. Hey, get out. of your rifle and made a splint for my daddy's leg. Well, you know the prairie, Miss Mercy. There, there ain't much else at hand. Ain't. Hey, now, you know better than that. <laughs> Isn't, just don't, doesn't just seem to fit the surroundings. Well, there's nothing to be ashamed of in education, I hope. You're right. But it does irritate a lot of folks who never had a chance at it. Oh, you've been finding that out at the ranch? Well, maybe. Not my father, certainly. I wouldn't think so. <laughs> Mike Patterson, I bet. I didn't say so. You wouldn't have to. How come my daddy didn't send him to pick me up when he couldn't come himself? And I reckon you'll have to ask him that. I just reckon I will have to do that. I'll bet Mike was fit to be tied. You and he have a... have an understanding? Now that's better. Proper use of the subjunctive case, not you and him. I said my mother was a school teacher. <laughs> Did she bring you up? So, though. I got most of my schooling in St. Louis. To be a cowhand? Oh, that came after I graduated. I went south and did a heap of wrangling. And then I went for cattle drives. With your education, what made you choose that kind of life? Oh, I thought it was a way to come northwest to see my mom. And... And? A way of life, I guess. Gets bred into the bones and the blood. I love this country. I got my roots in it. And I'm a cattleman at heart. Hard to explain. Mm, not to me. Why do you think I brought all this baggage with me? Just for a visit? I wouldn't know. This ain't no visit, then. I'm back home where I belong. To stay. Of course, she wasn't looking at me when she said that, but out across the flatlands to the mountains where the red was beginning to turn purple as the sun dipped low. But my heart gave a leap like it does when you hook some old trout, and I knew the first moment I got back I was going to sign on at the Crown M, in spite of Black Mike and the trouble I knew had to come between us sooner or later. Mercy! Mercy, it's good to see you again. Mike, <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, yeah, here, let me, let me help you down. Uh, thank you. Hey, uh, uh, hey, you, you, Dan. Here, you can take the rig to the back door to offload it. We won't need you. Mercy! Oh, come on and let me see you. Oh, Give me a hug. Are you all right? Oh, oh, honey, never oh. better except for this temporary game leg. Oh, Daddy. <laughs> oh, 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 don't knock me off my pins. Oh, it's so <laughs> good to see you and so... <laughs> Good to be home. All right, all right, boy. Let's get that buck wagon moving. Hey, yeah, uh, hold it, Mike. Hold it now. You can take the wagon. Dan and me have got some business. <laughs> you uh, brought what I asked, Dan? Yeah, I did, sir. Right in the saddlebag beside me. All right, bring it in, then. Whatever you say, Mr. Chalmers. All right, Mr. Toady. You won't be walking high and mighty long. Yeah, so now, how do you like the better half of the, the Chalmers family, Dan? Miss Mercy's a mighty fine lady. 
If you're going to sign him on, Daddy, I think it ought to be his butler. <laughs> Don't you run down Dan Bowles, honey. I owe him my life, and according to Doc Reynolds, the fact that I'll be able to walk again. Oh, I wouldn't dream of running him down. He's too good at doing that for himself. Well, I'm going upstairs to freshen up. Could someone bring me my bag? Uh, just as soon as Mike gets him off the wagon, I'll have the house boy bring him up to you. I won't be long. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's a caution. But it's good to see her home. Come on in my office, son. We'll uh, get that money in the safe. Yeah, well, it's all here. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> you don't think I'd be siphoning any off on you? Well, I told you to buy yourself some gear. Now, see, at least, see, you got some new clothes. Oh, sure. I also picked up a saddle and such, but I used my own money. <sighs> okay. That's as you please. I still got some money laid by. You gonna sign on with me? Well, I'm not right sure I should. Why? Well... One good reason. Your ranch boss and me, we don't hit it off so good. Yeah, well, <clears throat> for all his drawbacks, he's, uh, he's the best I ever had. <clears throat> Anything wrong, Mr. Chalmers? No, 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 just a twinge <clears throat> in my leg. Yeah, <clears throat> where were we? Uh, about my signing on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it isn't only what you did for me, but now, I'll tell you square out. Now, I took a liking to you from the first. And right at this time in my life, I... Well, I don't know how to put it except... except I need you, Dan. Now, with Mercy home and determined to stay, I, you know, she's just as taken by you as I am. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> well, I can't lay it out much plainer. I, I hope you'll stay. At least a while. I reckon you don't have to twist my arm, Mr. Chalmers. Oh, my damn, son, that lifts a heap off of my mind. Uh, <clears throat> while you were throwing your money around, uh, you pick up a gun to carry on your hip, hmm? No, sir. Hmm. Well, I got no choice, son. I have to warn you against Black Mike. He might call you out. You ought to be ready. I'm ready, sir. But not with a gun. Never with a gun. A gun is to live by, not to die by. Easy to say, but the West of Dan Bowles' time wasn't ready to be that civilized or to recognize any law beyond the simple solution of a lead slug. Dan Bowles is a man of principle, however, and his principles are to lead him into such dangerous traps that may sign his death warrant not once, but twice. I shall return shortly with Act Three. As the hot summer passed on, no threat of the violent events to come showed. Hale Chalmers' leg was healed, so he could ride his horses with his old abandon. Mercy settled back into the rhythm of ranch life. Mike Patterson was fully absorbed in the handling of the stock in preparation for the fall drive to market. And Dan? Well, he was the fuse, primed for the explosion. Because Hale used him as a minister without portfolio, a sort of second-in-command circulated to every field of the ranch life and management. But a delayed fuse is just as dangerous as any other. Where the devil do you think you're going? Mr. Chalmers' orders. I'm taking Miss Mercy to town. I need you to help cut out cattle for the market. I guess you're just going to have to wait until I get back. I'm telling you something, Bowles. I ain't going to wait much longer till you and me have a showdown. While you're in town, better get yourself a gun. Right at home on the range. And I sure never do hear a discouraging word. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. I was thinking. How about an encouraging word? Huh. Don't do that, ma'am. Ma'am. But are you determined to sell yourself into slavery? 
And I have since I first met you. Now that is more like it. Stop the horses. We're running a piece behind town. You won't. I will. All right, Dan Bowles. Let's you and me have a showdown. Don't you think it's about time? Yeah, I reckon. Everyone wants to call me out. You ought to be the first. Why me first? Because you know you got me hog-tied and thrown. And what's the sense of keeping up the pretense? Why would you want to? I'm not worthy of you, Mercy. Mercy? First time you called me that? Yeah, and it should be the last. Why? Because if I let it stand and you let it stand, it changes a whole heap of things between us. It doesn't change a thing, Dan Bowles. It just gets it out in the open. And about time. I am just not going to wait around any longer. And if you can't speak up for yourself, I will. I know you love me. Why don't you do something about it? Well, see, you you don't understand. I don't want to understand. I just want you to tell me what you do. It seems like I don't have to. Well, you better. You've kept me waiting long enough. Oh, darling. Whee! Oh, we'd better get on into town fast and round up that license. I may be a mite forward, but I still want to stay a decent woman. The old buckboard was skimming over air. I knew I should turn it around and head back for the ranch and have my own showdown with Mr. Chalmers. But Mercy's eyes were shining. My heart was plumb ready to swell up and burst. We did have business in Miller's Junction. It was difficult to say goodnight. But finally, Mercy went up to her room. I should have known better and gone to my own, but well, I thought a drink might clear my head. So I made the mistake of going to the bar. Hey, bartender. Uh, give me another blast of that rot gut and leave the bottle. Hey, do you want me, partner? I'll buy my own, mister. <laughs> no offense. Just making a little play, uh, Mr. Patterson. Can they tell me you're the, uh, you're the ranch boss up at the Crown M? Hmm? What if I am? We help. Since you just rode in, I thought you might be looking to sign on some hands for the fall drive. I'm ready, willing, and able. Oh, you got a horse and gear? Sure. Where'd you ride last? Uh, up Oregon Way. You're a lazy kid. Hey, wait a minute. You want the word on me? Well, you look at who just walked in. <laughs> well, boy, if it ain't old Red Engine himself. Hey, Dan, old partner, it's Pete Quinney off the Lazy Q. Hey, Pete. <laughs> Great to see you. What you doing up this way? Well, I run a drive up to Chisholm and was on my way home. Oh, boy, it is good to see you, Engine Dan. Hey, you could put a word in for me with the boss here, maybe, huh? Engine Dan, huh? That's your usual nickname? Yeah, uh, some places. How come? My father was a Cheyenne. I knew it. I knew it. I could smell it the first time we met. A half breed. Hey, hey, hey! Not now. Now, Don't, 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 don't be so fast, Whippy. If you're looking for a job, don't mess between us. You want to ride out to Crown M tomorrow? I think I can promise you one. Sure looks mighty definite. There's going to be an opening. Hey, uh, Dan. Dan, I see something wrong. No, it's nothing more than I should have said long before this. Bake, you got to help me out. Just thanks. I want to borrow your horse and get back to the ranch. And I want to ask you to escort a lady out to the Crown M tomorrow by buckboard. I didn't know just what I had in mind. Only that I wanted to talk to Mr. Chalmers before Black Mike did. Even if it meant riding through the night to get back to the ranch. <coughs> As I got to the corral... All right, hold it. Hold it right there, engine. What? You get yourself a fighting gun like I told you. Oh, it's you, Mike. No, I didn't. Well, it's too bad. I tell you what, I got me two guns. No, don't you even move toward that rifle. I'll just fire one of my guns in the air and plug you dead with the other. Then I'll toss the other gun alongside you. <laughs> there won't be no problem. An Indian don't have much rights in this country anyway. You're not getting mercy. Or this ranch. Or taking anything away from me, you understand? You better get ready to join your ancestors. I'm telling you, one man will never miss you now. Knowing what you are. And that's Hale Chalmers. Ah, ah, oh, I... 
I never figured that. You, you all right, Dan? Well, yeah, yes, Mr. Chalmers, but I was awake. A pain was bothering me. I heard him, I Mike, ride up. Then you, Helpful Leather, come out on the porch to see what in tarnation was going on. I, I couldn't let him kill you. I, I owe you that, at least. Uh, he meant to... He meant to murder me. Yeah, I understand his feelings. My own were the same. What do you mean? I have a daughter. And I have a ranch. And I had a dream. I haven't long to live. When you found me half dead and set my leg and brought me home, I thought every prayer I ever made had been answered. I knew Mercy wouldn't stay. That she had her roots back here. The ranch would be hers, but she needed a man to run it with her. And Mike Patterson, for all he wanted to be, was not the answer. It looked to me like you were. And it seemed to look that way to Mercy. Mercy loves me, sir, as I do her. She loves what she thinks you are, what I thought you were. Not some sneaking, dirty, below-contempt half-breed. You speaking for yourself? Or any right-thinking American. I dispute your title. One half of me is more American than any wish or dream can make you. But it's an argument don't make no sense. I guess there's only one answer now. Get out. While the getting's good. Not for your sake. But for mercy's sake. Where's my daughter? I left a friend of mine to escort her home. Don't worry. He's a hundred percent... Not American, but white. I couldn't just walk out of Mercy's life without at least an explanation. So, riding my own horse and with Bakes on trail, I headed back for town. I was less than halfway there when I met them. The old buckboard swaying and lumbering as Bake drove the horses full out. Whoa there, boy. Now hold up, hold up. Oh, darling, are you all right? I'm okay. Oh, I thought you and Black Mike had tangled. Oh, oh Dan, I was afraid you might be dead. No, not, not me. Mike? Your father shot him to save my life. Oh, darling. i never seen a man so stubborn in my life. Now, why don't you pack a gun? Why don't you take your horse and ride on to the ranch, Big? There'll be more than one place for you there now. But, but, Miss Chalmers... Uh, Dan can see me home safe. Or, uh, Mercy knows her own way. Well, as you say, uh, Dan, if what I said last night had... Forget it, Bake. It had to come out. <laughs> I should have made it clear long since. Well, I just hope I didn't cause no trouble. Well, I guess you know the truth by now. You mean the awful truth? Well, that depends on the point of view. Well, my point of view is yours. Yeah, but not your father's. He has no right to think as he does. I love him, but he's wrong. Yes, but that doesn't make me any more the right for you. Well, there's one way to solve it all. How? Well, you wouldn't make a dishonest woman of me no matter how hard I've tried... Will you take me back to Miller's Junction and make me an honest one? But your father... Well, once it's all over with, it'll be too late for him to have any objections. Not that he has any right. What do you mean? That will be my wedding present to you, Dan. Or the best part of my dowry. I'll tell you on the way back to town. If Mercy hadn't told me the whole story, I don't know if I ever would have gone through with it. But knowing the truth, I saw no reason not to, and we were married. The only thing I wouldn't do was run. I just had to make my peace with her father some way before we left, or at least let Mercy say goodbye to him. It was coming on to dusk by the time we set off back for the Crown M, and we were just going through a cut in the mountains when suddenly Mr. Chalmers showed up, loaded for bear. He drove his horse straight at us, stopping the wagon with a squeal and a groan, blocking the road as he got off. Get out of that wagon, engine. Daddy, what are you going to do? You stay out of this, Mercy. You get yourself a shooting iron yet, engine Dan? No, sir. Stay back, Mercy. Let me handle it. Okay. I brought one for you. Here. Now go on, pick it up and defend yourself. 
I don't shoot any man without a weapon. Even an engine who sneak behind my back. Daddy, listen to you me. You pick it up. No, sir. If you want to shoot me, I offer you no excuse. <laughs> the blue stallion. Remember I told you the sign of death in my family. Pick up that gun. Watch out, sir. The stallion. <laughs> are, are you all right, darling? Yes, I'm all right. But my rifle... Why did you fire? He didn't shoot. I fired at the stallion. What, what happened to Daddy? Your father... Oh, did, did I shoot him? My heart gave out. Been living on borrowed time. Oh, Daddy, Daddy. Oh, it's all right, Princess. I couldn't have lived... Oh, do you, Mary? Yes. Oh, there's something I have to tell you. Why? Daddy, I... I've known for years... Ever since Mother died. What does it matter? I loved you just the same, and I never knew him. You were all the father I ever wanted. But I am not ashamed of my Indian blood. You got to understand. I loved her. It wasn't her fault. She was taken against her will. I was proud to marry her, to give her child, and to give you her name. Dan? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I shouldn't have tried to, to put one man's guilt on all, all your race. Forgive me. What's that? The Blue Roan Stallion. Take care of the ranch. The Crown Him Mercy. Don't worry about me. You'll carry me to rest. and bigotry die hard. A man like Hale Chalmers, for all his good points, could never have admitted that his daughter had other blood in her veins but his. But perhaps beyond the waters where the great stallion carried him, he may find wisdom among his equals and learn to smoke with them the pipe of peace. I'll be back shortly. Celebrating a bicentennial, 200 years ago when our forefathers won their freedom, from the Missouri to the great mountain slopes of the West, the Indian and the buffalo roamed the central plains in freedom of their own. Today, both Indian and the animal he depended on for his life are almost extinct. Neither buffalo nor his hunter were able to adapt to a changing way of life. And yet, life is a constant change and challenge. Let's hope our America will continue as it always has to meet both challenge and change. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Rosemary Rice, Earl Hammond, and Joe Silver. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. In older times, he's turning into the apartment house... She reminds me. Yes? Where have I seen her before? Have you seen her before? That's her. The old woman who was in my diner the night Tom Fessler was killed. The one who threatened him with retribution? She's got different hair, but I'd never forget that face. Well, Inspector. Well, what, Louise? Do I pick her up? And suppose she doesn't have the gun. You realize the only thing that can hang her is a twenty-two caliber, nothing else. Suppose I arrest her right now. Suppose she isn't carrying the gun. No, the only thing we can do is put a tail on her, have her shadowed night and day, and wait until she wants to use that pistol again. But if we delay, it could be too late. And if we move now, it could be too early. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoy this.
this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you've enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this